dad. I went to Waterbury. And I'm a college dropout. Still UW. Yeah, yeah, yeah. UW Whitewater. Uh, yeah. From Champaign, Illinois. From Champaign, Peoria, Illinois. Moved up here in eighth grade. So that's where my Chicago ties come from. I'm a uh, fan of the you know, enemy bears here in Wisconsin. Yeah. Uh, what brought you to Madison? So my father's job, taking over the office in, in Madison, brought me here. Very quickly became a Badger fan. Yep. It's hard not to, uh, being in Madison. Uh, but the rest of the loyalties stayed with Chicago, Cubs, Blackhawks, Bulls and Bears. Uh, okay. And so, you know, that rivalry runs deep here in Wisconsin. So then you, what was your, what was your goal with schooling? With schooling? Between, you know, I between went, schooling and, and where you ended up now. Uh, so that's that's a really interesting question. So I didn't go to college. So my parents didn't go to college. Uh, and my dad worked really hard, came from blue, both came from blue collar roots uh, and worked really hard. And my dad was jumping on and off trains. Um, I don't know what his exact title was, but he worked for the train company and uh, connecting trains and, and whatnot and working cutting glass at a glass company before he found uh, his career in insurance sales and then financial advising. Okay. And so my dad was the one that really changed the landscape for our family and trajectory for our family. And so, uh, but still going through school, like I had friends, I remember uh, sitting in ACT or SAT preparatory classes and I'm like, what are they what are they doing like right. my parents didn't tell me to do that now i did end up taking the act and i did actually fairly well on it but i had no studying whatsoever i went to college to play football like i didn't go to college to go to college okay. and so when i stopped playing football after my second year i really lost my identity and therefore lost my will to go to college so then i just started working right away and so the bridge to that then is I was always in sales in uh, Circuit City back in the day when Circuit City was around. Right. And then Best Buy because Best Buy took over Circuit City. And Best Buy was a much bigger deal back then before Amazon, before Walmart got into electronics. It was just a much bigger deal. And so um, had a great career with uh, being a sales manager, getting paid pretty well for a 22-year-old, right. 21 to 24. And then I uh, begrudgingly joined my father in financial services. I say begrudgingly because him and I were not in the best spot at that time, but that was the best choice that I ever made and had a great career with that. So that was not the goal in the beginning. What, what did you aim to do? I didn't know. Outside of football? Outside of football, I didn't know. I wanted to be successful. Right. But I would say this, when I was uh, working at Best Buy, the first book my dad handed me, because he knew I was kind of lost and he knew I was driven, but I was also very ADD. He handed me Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Okay. And I couldn't put it down. And I've read that book many times since then. And it really fueled my passion for learning and self-growth. Mm -hmm. And so I've read over 2,000 books now, and most of it in the personal development, leadership, business building space. And that's really what, so I, I feel like I'm a self-taught student. Because I didn't stop going to school. I just went to the school of hard knocks. I went yep. to the school of, I'm a personal development and really dive in. I've gotten, I've been coached by some of the best coaches in the industry, uh, in the coaching industry, I should say, and uh, feel really blessed to have been uh, developed by them. And now I just get a lot of passion in developing others. Very cool. And you, you ended up owning or starting an Anytime Fitness? I did. How did that so that was actually my wife and I. Um, so my wife went, was going to go to law school uh, before she met me. And then I was firmly entrenched in the financial services career and uh, doing well. And so we had a conversation about family. We had a conversation about uh, life and what that looks like 5, 10, 20 years from now, which I don't think a lot of couples do. Uh, so this was really, I don't know if it was just a stew of us or it was just ingrained because we both came from good parenting. Mm -hmm. um, but we had to talk about, hey, if you were going to law school because it was a huge passion of yours and you've always wanted to be a lawyer, like, go do that. I'll support you. But if it was about money, like, we're going to be fine. And so we, we pivoted and she always had a passion about health and nutrition and, you know, come full circle now that we've had four kids and they're all getting back into school. She's now going to get her master's in nutrition. Very cool. But at that anytime fitness level, so we we dove into some research. It was really a budding franchise, and uh, we owned the one downtown Madison and uh, made that successful for five years. And when we found out we were pregnant with number two, uh, we realized you know 
family was really important. Her being home to be able to raise the kids was important. So we sold that to a guy that owns a lot of them and is very successful in that industry. Were you doing that in tandem with Northwestern? Yeah. Okay. So I was, but really my wife was running it. So I was just doing the financials and, and the business planning side of things and helping her as, as need be. But we were both working 14, 16 hours a day at that time. Um, so it was good that we didn't have kids and then, or waited to have kids for right. a little bit so that we could do that and not burn the candle on both ends. That makes sense. It's a good move. Um, <laughs> Hindsight being 2020. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Looking at it now. Um, when you were at Northwestern, what was your drive? What was your goal? Something with, with ATF, uh, just as a publication, um, and the content we produce in the magazine, interviews, podcasts, the whole thing. Um, we, our goal is to seek out stories that are inspiring, educational, yeah, just interesting, um, that are all within and around the cigar industry, but that doesn't just include people who are in those industries it's yeah. people who we came across through those industries that and have a shared passion around right and it's it's clear your drive and career was a pretty clean and crisp example of the american dream and was that something that was in your mind not the american through? dream so much i think that uh, you know so i'm a college dropout and i was told that you have to go to college to be successful and I think a lot of people are told that. Right. Uh, I don't know if you resonate with that statement at all, but like it, it is ingrained to go into six figures of debt yep. to get a four-year degree and then go work for a $50,000 a year job yep. coming out right out of school. And then, then earn your chops, then earn your expertise, and then you can go do something. And I'm like, that just never made sense to me, either because I was ADD or because my parents didn't go to school and my dad was successful uh, without school. Um, whatever it was, I, I'm not certain, but once I got into that, I was driven by, uh, well, let me back up yep. best buy. I was told no for a raise and I was running the top three store in the country okay. and that really didn't sit well with me. And uh, then I got a call from someone at Northwestern that wasn't my father that I thought actually my father put him up to it to just kind of like prod me. Um, but he didn't, he actually called on me and, uh, to sit down with me as a client cause he didn't put two and two together that I was Steve Kosnick's son. And so, uh, as that happened, I sat back in my chair and I go, I need to be doing that. Something that no one's in control of my revenue. Mm -hmm. So no one's in control of my, of what I can make or what my ceiling is. Um, so I, I quit and started in that zero, you know, base goal commission career and just really dove in. And right. I, I just immersed myself in knowledge and getting designations, continuing to read personal development stuff. And the more and more I got into it, the more and more I read, the more and more I wanted to be like those, like the greats of the industry or the greats of the world. Right. And so I don't think there's anything special about me whatsoever. In fact, I think there's people way smarter than me. I think that I just work harder than most. Sure. And so, and that's what's led me to where I'm at today and being able to, um, you know, come out to a cool property that you're able to come out to this morning or, or be able to uh, have the freedom to take my kids on, you know, spring break or whatever it may be. Um, freedom comes with working hard and, and having the capital to do so. Yeah, so we're at your 80-acre ranch outside of Madison. And this is the headquarters, for lack of better words, of your new business yeah. and your I mean, new yeah. venture. Yeah, and we could say that. And, and just a, a great spot to meet great people. We built this uh, podcast studio out here. And what you can't see is we're actually in a hayloft and, and a garage. And uh, we built this great studio to be able to have great conversations for me to host my podcast and, uh, and bring awesome people out. And then so the whole property is centered around being able to bring all, uh, great people out that are looking to grow in all facets of their life. So whether that's fitness and nutrition, whether that's leadership, whether that's business, whether it's uh, spiritual, we want to create a spot for people to come and uh, grow right. in all those facets. We reconnected over, well, first off, I've been watching the stuff you've been posting and writing on, on Facebook, Instagram, um, and even your, your podcast that you were doing previously. Um, and in a post that you posted maybe a month ago, there was a legendary collection of 
bourbon and cigars <laughs> in the background. And then that sparked my interest. Yeah, you're like, hey, what the heck are you doing? Right, and so we hadn't talked in years. Yeah. Um, and then we just got together again. Well, clearly the collection is not something that's brand new. No. And that interest is not something that's been brand new. Well, I would say it's really sprung in the last two years, though. What initially got you into it? Well, I'll say my first cigar was with my dad when I was 16 years old. I smoked it. It was an H. Upman. Um, and a Cuban um, Upman? No, no, okay. no, no. It's a Dominican Upman, and um, <laughs> which I've had uh, Cuban Upmans now, but that one was Dominican. Uh, I was 16. I was at my uh, father's friend's lake house, and I smoked it like a cigarette and uh, puked my guts up. Just, just awful experience. Uh, so why am I smoking cigars today, right? With that awful experience. Well, my right. next experiences weren't that awful. And it probably took me some years to get back and uh, obviously learn my lesson not to try and smoke it like a cigarette mm -hmm. um, at 16 years old. So then, you know, through golf, through social settings, through other um, uh, beings, and then being around my father, who also is a cigar smoker, you know, we were able oh hunting. You know, another prime example, we have, yep. uh, you know, get back to the lodge after uh, a cold day out in the stands. Uh, it's nice to have a refreshing cocktail, bourbon, beer, great cigar amongst friends. And so I think that's really what fueled it. Now, fast forward the last two years and what you saw, <clears throat> what Alex saw was a post that I just finished 75 Heart. And for those of you that don't know, 75 Heart is a workout program that you go 75 days, two workouts per day. Uh, one has to be outdoors, one indoors. Well, I just did this in the winter in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So it was not pleasant to be outside. And that's kind of the point of it. It's, it's 75 Heart, not 75 Easy. And so this whole last month of it, right? So it's 75 days. So it's two workouts a day, no alcohol, sticking to a diet, no cheat meals, uh, and a few other items. <laughs> I, the whole last month, I'm envisioning what bourbon am I going to drink the first night I can. Right. Because I'm not, fin I'm, I'm one that's going to finish this program. So I was taking a video and, and, and you saw behind me my bourbon collection, which has a lot of stuff. I ended up going with Eagle Rare 17, which was my choice. Right. Uh, that's my favorite bourbon of all time. I haven't tried all the bourbons out there, but especially the antique collection. That's that or uh, WLW would be my two favorite. For stuff like Eagle Rare 17. Or just some of the bottles we talked about. What do you think sets apart an okay whiskey to some of the really high dollar stuff or rare stuff? Because mm -hmm. if you're in Facebook groups and all over hunting yeah. down some of these bottles. Yeah, finding them in the wild is becoming really impossible. Unless you're in certain states to get an abundance of stuff. Like for some reason, Ohio gets uh, antique weller by the boatloads. And the rest of like us. the state of Ohio, yeah, the state of Ohio for some reason. Like all my friends in Ohio have plenty of just its Weller antique symmetry to Kentucky or what? I, I don't know the reason. Someone smarter than me probably does. But what I think is actually how it finishes, how it finishes, how okay. it starts, the start, middle, and finish. If if the start and middle is good, but it doesn't finish, that doesn't work for me. And I found that for cigars. Yep. I found that for bourbon. I found that for steak of like most fine things, like I want it to finish uh, really well. And so it can change flavor profiles from start to finish. Um, it can stay consistent. I'm not necessarily picky about that. It just has to finish for me. Like if it's, and that's where I've shifted to go into some more higher proof stuff. So like of Blanton's, like regular Blanton's, if, it's a, if that's what's at the bar, I'll drink it. Yep. But I'd prefer to have the straight from the barrel, not just because of the higher proof, but because it finishes better. Right. Yeah, age does something. Age does something to whiskey that's magical. <laughs> age does something to cigars that's magical, right. too. So speaking of that, you're very into Opus. What what sparked that? Was it, not to say, not as an insult to Fuente, but was it falling for their, their brilliant marketing? Or, or did you find something else interesting with them? You know, they do have brilliant marketing. First of all, here's a Opus uh, custom-made lighter that a friend made for me. Uh, custom-made Zippo, I should say. Um, they do have brilliant marketing. I, yeah, don't, want to, do. I don't want to uh, discredit that whatsoever. Uh, it wasn't their marketing. I felt I had some friends that, were, uh, that had introduced me to uh, the BBMF, 
which uh, I had never even seen a cigar like that. So I was previously smoking uh, CAO 660 Flatheads, sure. uh, Oliva V uh, Milano, or uh, Oliva Master Blend was one of my favorites yep. for an uh, inexpensive smoke. Um, so those are some of the ones I would smoke, especially on the golf course. Uh, the Flathead was great for the golf course because it was a, a bigger smoke that would last a little while. And then I, I just graduated. Uh, I feel like, and not, not that I would not smoke those, but now like the Opus stuff and some of the complexities that comes through there, and even some of the regular line uh, Fuente stuff, um, the uh, oh, the Untold Story is a more recent one that came out. You know, big long, all oh, right, uh, and, and it's a Maduro wrap, and it's just smooth. It's not as complex as some of the Opus stuff, but it is smooth and consistent the whole way through for a Maduro wrap. It has this medium vibe to it that has some dark chocolate notes and is just a great smoke. And it's a regular Fuente line that you're not going to uh, pay as much for the Opus on. Right. Um, but then the other things like LFD and Illusion Bull is another golf course favorite because it's hardy. Uh, and then for me, what I'm smoking right now is a La Asepcion uh, Don Jose. Uh, this is one of my favorite Cubans, uh, and I love Cubans in the morning with coffee. Right. So typically, my routine is a a Cuban with coffee in the morning, and uh, uh, NC non-Cuban, which uh, Opus is my go-to yep. uh, in the afternoon. There's such a range with the Opus line when they come out. Like there's the um, uh, what's the what's the line, uh, the Siglo. Yeah. Um, which you can find 20, 30 bucks mm -hmm. when they come out. When they, I know come. they Yeah, they, add, they, they climb up in value. And then there's just the complete unicorn stuff. When they develop those, it's clearly not for the market. Like it's, it's not something that the average cigar smoker will find. And so to the marketing, and we talked about this a little bit before, what do you think they're doing that's, that's unique that creates the the craze over opus like you've got guys back in the day like pete johnson who was the crazy guy at the cigar shows with the opus tattoo knew everything about opus um and yeah they just, they just created this fan base from the beginning yeah and i don't claim to know everything about it everything at all i know a lot about opus i know a lot about cubans but i have friends in in uh some uh groups uh, online and otherwise that uh, really helped me and have helped me in my education over the last two years. And I still lean on for um, what should I be paying for something? Um, you know, which one ages best? Right. Uh, you know, which one should I, you know, buy a box of and smoke and buy a box of and store for a few years? Um, so there's friends that I'll lean on for that all the time. But one of the things that I think Opus does is creates that specialness, like that unicorn, yep. right? So like, I didn't learn unicorn terminology until I learned Opus. Right. I mean, honestly. So it was, it was okay, so finding, um, you know, a Blue Lancero, a 20th anniversary Blue Lancero, and smoking that for the first time, you know, and seeing the craze behind it, that it's secondaries at $350, mm -hmm. right? And you can't even find it at retail. So, or um, the Stefano Ricci is one of my favorite uh, unicorn Opus uh, cigars. Um, so if I can find those, um, whether it's through friends, um, whether it's through cigar shop owners that are heavy into Opus that, that uh, sometimes get them and I even have to pay secondary through them, mm -hmm. like I'm going to, I'm going to go try that. But I think it's very similar to what Blanton's has done as well with creating specialness and limited, uh, to drive that craze because anything special and limited in marketing works because people are like, Oh, I can't, I can't get this. Right. Or, you know, this is, doesn't come in abundance, so I have to snatch it up now. It otherwise, works, otherwise the, quality I has to back, it the quality has to back it up. The quality has to back it up, right. Because if it does, like, it could be limited and it's a shit product and you're like, okay. Right. right. Yeah, there's a lot of that out there. Limited runs, rare quantity, quality sucks. The story isn't, isn't interesting. And that's interesting because there's, there's so many cigars out there or products in general, especially in this space, that... They might be doing something super unique and the quality is great. The story is not that interesting and an interesting story can carry a product for a little while. But if the product doesn't match, it'll just fizzle out. Yep. Um, and you see that, I think, when cigars get rated number one. Uh, 
I don't remember what it was last year, but I'm convinced, and you can because you're in the industry more, you can tell me differently. But I'm convinced that the ratings are based on advertising dollars. There's that is a that's a pit of debate, which is super <laughs> super interesting. I don't know if and, I opened a can of worms here, but the like, bottom line is like you see them like oh this was rated number one last year, and then you're like well okay well I'll try that, yep. and then you try it and you're like eh. Yeah, I think part of it, I mean, like you have Padron on the CA list that just stays on the top all the time. Padron it's a, should stay on the top. It's a phenomenal cigar. But does and it's it, so does, consistent. Does it, does it deserve or should the rating system allow it to sit at the top forever? Or should the rating system reset every year and say best of this year? There, that, okay, and that's a different, there. and that's, that's a different, different thing. thing, right? So then you could be like, oh, "What best cigar released this year?" Versus right. like, you know, you have the Padron Fifty Year or Padron Eighty Year. Like those are consistently great cigars. That yep. there's not many cigars that are in the world that are that that consistent and that good. So those should really like, okay, what's your all time great cigars, and yep. then what's your brand new releases this year that are just phenomenal. I would get down with that. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know the guys at Cigar Aficionado, but from what I've heard, it's the same panel. Mm. I'm sure it fluctuates as time goes on, but it's the same panel of guys smoking these cigars, and they're, it's like their flavor profiles stay the same. Yeah. So it's natural that the the ratings will continue to sort of keep same cigar, same profile on top. But there's some interesting stuff out now, like JR Cigars is doing uh, doing their list. Cigar Dojo is out there. They're doing a consensus list i believe half wheels doing it as well i was well. just thinking that like give them a thousand of my uh buddies together uh that all love smoking cigars and then let's rank them and then that's how you should because then you have a variety a thousand different people of uh different flavor profiles because we're all yep. different like you may hate blends and i may love it and you may love antique weller and i may hate it right which i do by the way antique weller yeah i love all weller except for the antique one why is that? Um, it burns too hot. Like it's like, and some people even say it's a poor man's uh, lot B, uh, uh, Van Winkle lot B, and um, I, I I just disagree. I just think it, it runs too hot. Okay. It doesn't like it starts hot and it doesn't like even out from. But others love it. They have not been able to dive into the high end stuff enough. Well, that's the crazy um, pieces about Weller is these right. bottles for retail are actually. Very, um, very meaning to, um, I mean, like the, I think, uh, single barrel, like retails around 45 to 60 or somewhere around there. You yeah. Right out the gate, it. the prices aren't bad. You just can't find it. So then secondary, you pay 750 up. I saw at one point it was up to 950. From 45 to 950. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the margin right, right there. Right. Right. <laughs> Someone's doing something right. Um, that's super interesting. The, the cigar, the cigar market ratings, even even guys that like at Half Wheel. I don't know if you've read mm -hmm. their reviews. Super objective as much as they can be, which is cool to see. But even then, they'll get flack for advertising, or they may have someone on their site that they're advertising to give the cigar a poor review, and they'll say this in their in their online content. Where they'll lose advertisers or they'll lose relationships with factories and brands just because they're honest about a cigar. In other review ratings or systems, it's I don't know if they're they're buying ads or they're which which sucks too, right? Because you would prefer to have someone have an independent voice, and it's like, but then their livelihood depends on those advertising dollars, yeah. right? But on the flip side, you would want them to be objective. Yep. Hence the problem with all media nowadays. Right, it's not just half wheel. Right, it's all media. Yep, is their livelihood belongs to the corporations that pay ad dollars, so therefore their narrative, and we can go down a way deep uh, rabbit right. hole here. So I'll probably stop after this, but like that's what drives the narrative on media, and therefore we are left as the public to determine what's true and not true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's happening everywhere, and I don't know. How, is there other than only taking advertisement from companies that are completely separate from the industry you're working in. I guess that works in advertising for cigars or whiskey, but news and whatever other media, that's not, well, I would think not like, the same game. Yeah. It's not the same game. I would think like it, what goes well with cigars, coffee, whiskey, 
rum. Right. Like maybe you get those advertisers in there and you do kind of a cross pollination. Right. Finding good cigars, good stories behind them is awesome. And I feel like one of the best things is when you have a cheap cigar, farm rolled, don't know what it is, and the experience with the cigar mm. and the people you're with. Um, can make that the best cigar you've ever smoked yeah. or, or I was talking to someone and they're like, the best cigar I had was on the beach. And I think they were in Jamaica. And I was like, what was, was it? it? They're like, fake, no yeah. clue. <laughs> it was short filler tasted like crap. I was with my favorite people. Weather was perfect. Food was great. Have no clue what the cigar is still my favorite cigar. Yeah. And that's, you have the contrast of, of those well, people. Well, because I was with the people, right? Right. And so one of the things that uh, was advised to me, do you keep a cigar dossier? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, cigar dossier, and I mean, we're preaching to the choir here, but I, I, I keep a paper one. I, I think there's some apps that do it as well. Yeah. But I like the paper one to be able to put my bands so if it's the first time I've smoked that cigar. One of the advice I was given with it uh, by a good friend was state who you're with and where, where you're at. It I helps you remember it. And then helps you uh, go back to that experience of being with great company, smoking a great cigar, enjoying yourself, enjoying life. I believe there's a cigar journal out there. I'll have to find it and, and link it to this video. It's, it's, it's cool if you can find it. Um, it's just that. It's you put the band, you say what the cigar is, and then it asks for no details about the cigar. A lot of them will say, like, how would you rate it? What were the flavor notes? Yep. This one is who are you with? What were you eating? Why were you there? Just everything about the experience and the cigar was just the the way to label that experience. Yeah, yeah I'm not great with flavor notes. Some people can no, be like, either. oh, it's, you know, it tastes like leather bound books and smells like rich mahogany. There's a little anchor man quote. Right. There. But <laughs> I mean, I mean, like people are like go out of their way. Oh, it's nutty. It's it's got dried cherry or something like I'm not great at that. I'm just like what tastes great to me. And then I can rank it, you know, one to 10 or whatever, um, which I'm really smoking a cigar that's below a seven at this point. Otherwise, I'm putting it out yep. because I have so many. I'm going to smoke something I like. Uh, but, yeah, I, I'm not great at the flavor profile. So the guys that and gals at Half Wheel are, I think, geniuses is for being able to draw all that out and yeah. be able to put it on paper in a really articulate way. It's interesting because those guys, they... I mean, I'm imagining they enjoy cigars, but they can never smoke cigars that they enjoy because all, all day they're smoking to review. And I believe they do it with no water, maybe maybe water, but I think water water might be off the list for some of them. Um, <laughs> and it's you're sitting there, take a Lancero, smoke it for three hours, like get everything out of it. And yeah. all you're doing is trying to get every flavor nut you can on paper. That's crazy. So like I have people and friends that are, you know, recovering alcoholics and they, they're, they'll talk about their favorite drinks being like a cream soda or a root beer yep. or a uh, black cherry soda. That's a boutique brand because that goes really well with their favorite cigars. For me, Cuban and coffee is just, I love it. I love it. And then in the afternoon is, uh, you know, maybe a sparkling flavored sparkling water or something like that. If it's an evening and I'm not doing a workout regimen, yep. I'm going to have a bourbon. Yep. Sometimes rum, sometimes some really good rum. What rums have you? So my sister-in-law is from towards. Cartagena, Colombia. So I have some, uh, uh, I can't even remember the name because they brought it back from Cartagena. Uh, but then I have some Cuban rums and uh, Dominican rums uh, that are on my bar right now. But uh, Zacapa is a, is a staple brand that's that's really good. Diplomatico. Uh, oh, Diplomatico is great. Are, are good, and, and I tend to do those neat. Whereas uh, with uh, bourbon, I like a big rock. Diplomatico with a heavy cigar is like as close as you can get to just drinking rum-flavored syrup, and it's delicious. <laughs> Yeah. So it's spe thick. Speaking of experience, though, uh, I was in Puerto Vallarta with a group of friends, and there's this old Cuban bar there. Okay. And it was one of the, that's probably what sparked my Cuban interest the most, was actually, um, you walk in there, I think it's the oldest bar in Puerto, is what they at least have the, on their moniker. Mm -hmm. And you walk in there, and there's a great Cuban humidor, they have phenomenal Cuban rum they have a cuban band playing and one of the most unique things of it was is a that everyone on staff knew their cigars knew their rum b the walls are covered in signatures and and tags and uh sayings or whatever with like there's not a 
white spot on the wall. So this place is so old, you take a Sharpie and you literally can write your name on any. So just anybody who goes spot. writes yeah. their name on the wall? Yeah. Really unique spot. I can't remember the name of it, um, but if you search oldest bar in Puerto, I'm sure you'll find it or Cuban bar on one of the main drags there. It's a phenomenal spot. And that's what sparked the Cuban side of things. I'd already dabbled in Dominican for a long time. Do you think there's validity to the, not the argument, but a lot of people will say Cuban quality is dropping, but you're going to get that based off of communist labor, <laughs> for no. lack of better words. But. Well, I don't think that's it. I think that uh, there's Cuban, Cuba is, um, the, there's conditions, weather conditions that will affect crop. Right. Um, so I don't think, uh, so there may be a, uh, down year for certain factories, uh, certainly. Um, and I've had some duds mm -hmm. uh, from some really reputable brands. And then, you know, you, and then all of a sudden they age and you're like, oh shit, th these have gotten good. Right. So I think it may be about aging, especially on the regular production. Now, if you're smoking a regional um, or, or say uh, one of my favorite Cubans, the Monte Cristo Dante, which is a EL. Um, I haven't had a bad one of those. Uh, I haven't had a bad Don Jose, uh, no matter the year. Now, this happens to be a 2015, so we got about seven years of age on it. Um, phenomenal. But I think it's more weather condition, much like California, the 2020 uh, fires. All right. Uh, uh, like Camus, you can't find Camus Cabernet right now. Does all and the vineyards burn? Or, or, or just... the smoke damage to the crops. Oh, that's right. To the grapes. So, I mean, one of my favorite uh, wines is Orange Swift, and I'm a part of their uh, Rare Reds um, uh, club. And he chose not to do a Mercury Head, which was, uh, I think, for 2020 or last year's variety, or maybe it was 2021. Um, he just said, I owe it to all of you, Dave Finney, the uh, the blend master blender, um, said, I owe it all to all the great customers to not put this out this year because Mercury Head is the staple of the Cabernet. It's the most expensive, their most expensive one. So I think Cuba would be susceptible to that, the weather conditions more than communist labor or anything else. Sure. But again, I'm not the foremost expert in that. That's just my opinion. No, but you've gotten into them. Yeah. You, you have plenty. A hell of a lot. Um, that's interesting. I have not had, I have not had enough. That farm world you gave me was phenomenal. Um, if, if I could gravitate towards towards any flavor profile or any region, it's Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. They have been, I mean, after Padron went, there's the exodus of everybody coming from Cuba, bringing Cuban seed to Nicaragua, and then just making great stuff with it. And so yeah. there's there's foundation out there. There's Drew Estate. There's Rocky Patel. They're um, doing some great stuff. And I know there was that that phase where everyone was like the cuban embargo is over and then it was a really brief phase it was a really <laughs> brief phase got a lot of attention really fast and then i, th I think the what it allowed you to do is go buy in cuba i had a lot of friends going by in cuba yeah and now that's i think ended off off the table yeah. again um so access to cubans is slowly dwindling again i mean you can get in there via speedboat and that's true. It's not that far. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend. Uh, yeah, I probably wouldn't recommend either, but yeah. It's a long speedboat ride. Yeah. Um, we get dropped off via helicopter into the speedboat in the middle of the ocean. And it's easy. Are you talking from experience? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> when you're smoking a cigar, everybody wants to pair bourbon with a cigar. That's the answer mm. pretty much every single time. Coffee in the morning, outside of that, it's bourbon only, which is interesting to me because bourbon is that's solely an American Mm -hmm. thing cigars are not and now it's like the whole cigar industry has been just cloaked with everything needs to be paired with bourbon and that's not from the factories uh -uh. and it, i think it's pete johnson at tatuaje who blends everything with orange crush that's fascinating now I would, that's on the sweeter end of things if it were me and i don't so i don't drink soda um I stopped that. Like, I would rather get my calories from a great meal. I would rather get my calories from uh, a great bourbon than I would a soda. So, 
Uh, that, that's just a personal life choice to me. But, you know, I have a lot of friends that do the cream soda thing. Uh, some, if they're doing interesting, here's an interesting combo um, that I've seen. A, a spice bomb of a cigar with a Dr. Pepper. Yeah. Which is that, also there's kind a of lot a going on. Bomb. There's a lot going on there. Right. So it's like their flavor profile just must like crave like boom. Like, you know, so uh, I've not tried it. Uh, he swears by it. But, right. uh, you know, so I think it's really just finding your liking. Like you, we were talking about that, that rum, mm -hmm. rum and Cubans, like the, the smoothness, just as like, it's just a tiny, tiniest of little sip on rum paired with a, a Cuban leaf is just out of this world. Right. Yeah, we had, we, I was in Miami in December and we went to Little Havana, which if you haven't been that, been down there and yeah. just walked down that street, yeah. super interesting experience. There's several factories and shops with the sign saying Cuban rolled, which isn't wrong because it's a guy from Cuba rolling <laughs> in the shop. And then there's a couple factories Play there. Play on words. Right, we'll right. And it works for advertising, yeah. I guess. Um, and then there's a couple shops down there. One of them's El Titan de Bronze, and that's where um, Willie Herrera is out of. So the master okay. blender at Drew Estate. Yeah. Um, we just walked in there not knowing anybody in there it's not a store they have this little like old jewelry counter looking thing and you can buy cigars out of that um but got i think a five pack there of just what they make and sell out of their shop um and then went to uh, a restaurant down there and had uh mojitos and if you've had cuban style mojitos mm -hmm. they're super sweet yes that with a cigar is the sugar it's like the sugar cane yeah uh, with that and, that and a little sweetness to the cigar um have you had the sober mesa uh brulee blue yeah yeah so that has a little sweetness to it right in this in the smoke it's a real mild smoke real smooth um is that is that a sweet tip no i don't think it is no no, no. so you can just there's, listen there's to there's steve talk about this and so, I'd... yeah there's a debate on it there's there's some guys that'll swear that they're that he adds some sweetness to it and then saka swears that he doesn't but whatever you say like there is a little bit of sweetness to it yep. like on the finish um so i could see that being paired with a mojito or uh something like that that could be really cool yeah everyone i mean like my first cigar that i that was premium that i enjoyed was the sweet jane by Deadwood, which is sweet. It's like cherry vanilla, but it's like if you took the League of Nine and infused it with natural cherry instead of just a flavored gas station cigar, um, which is an awesome gateway for those who don't know what to smoke, want something sweeter, or the Maker's Mark one. I have not a, had that. So that it, al a, it always appeared to be gimmicky to me, and I've just never, never grabbed it. I, so going back and thinking about, uh, as you asked me earlier about uh, my transition back into liking cigars after my bad experience with my Upman, my first experience, uh, Maker's Mark was a transition uh, thing for me because it had a little sweetness to it. Um, it's a mild to medium smoke, um, and and it just it just worked. So uh, I had I had smoked those back in the day. Obviously, graduated palate. Uh, right. Don't need that anymore. But as you were talking about, someone beginner trying to get into cigars or looking, that could be a good one. Right. That's the one in the glass too. Yep. Right. Yep. And has the uh, famous maker's wax on it the, as well. The patented wax strip. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah there, there's so many good cigars out there though, and in, and people have asked like, what cigar do you smoke to get into? cigars the first time i've never met someone that liked their first one um oh i like that first one i just didn't like the outcome sure well you're <laughs> inhaling <laughs> I did. Um, but, but yeah you're right there's probably but, someone like my wife hates this habit right. um you know and so she's got my kids on it now like daddy stop smoking my, my wife her. has attempted to smoke one cigar uh when we were in miami and it was a patron 1926 and the other night we had a bonfire and we're having cigars. You didn't even give her a Java? You gave her, you no, put she, her straight she, had, she didn't want one right away. And then uh, and then she saw what I was smoking. She's like, let me try it. And then she's like, oh, this is good. It may have had something to do with all the wine before. But yeah. but it was, uh, I was like, you started right. Yeah. I don't think many people start with something like that. But that's yeah. one that I would legitimately suggest to people. That or the Oliva V, the Milanio. Like, it doesn't leave that 
want for more flavor like well, that, some connecticut's can yeah there's well so right and um the maduros like a lot of novices that i've met think that darker wrap means stronger right and so i've had to educate a lot of novice friends that uh, hey actually no that can be quite a, a lot quite a bit smoother right uh and if you get the right one that's one thing you brought up wine we haven't talked about that yet i love a great red wine cabernet with a cigar as far as pairings right um you get a uh, great cab whether you know whether it's your things canis and then by the way for those like i don't just have expensive taste although i i do but uh my favorite like every night drinker is a joel got 815 yeah uh, 11 to 13 dollar bottle of cabernet or i think it may even be a red blend that it is but uh it's a great inexpensive bottle uh and my wife and i'll drink that frequently uh, and I'll drink red wine with cigars depending on the night. That's an excellent, excellent pairing. Broader questions. All right. Like we talked about a little bit earlier, the American dream and people who are pursuing the American dream is something that as a publication, as a magazine that we're focused on. Um, part of that is everybody has their own version of success or own definition of success, which can broaden from, I just achieved my goal that I had today or huge success in business or, or whatever that looks like. Yeah. What do you think, what is your definition of success? And what do you think people's definition should be? So this, uh, let me answer the second one first. Yeah. My definition of success should never be yours. Right. Uh, so I shouldn't be telling what other people's definition should be other than whatever that version is, you should be happy. Okay. So um, whether that's make a billion dollars, whether that's um, raise amazing kids that are that are productive and kind and uh, independent of mom and dad, uh, that, that can be a success, especially for parents that have struggled, especially for single moms or dads out there that are just trying to get by uh, and raise their kids to be kind and productive members of society. Um, so. I've been fortunate enough to to make a good amount of money through a lot of hard work um, and money don't. So like there's a saying out there that money is the root of all evil. That's not true. It's not true. Um, and because money's getting a bad name right now or like because uh, media or pol political are saying that because these people are rich, they're uh, automatically evil. Right. Um, not true. Look at Mackenzie Scott, uh, Jeff Bezos's ex-wife. She's donating she may go down as the single greatest philanthropist ever to walk this face of the earth. She's given away billions upon billions of dollars to the Boys and Girls Club, to Habitat for Humanity, and those are just two of her latest big ones. Uh, money is not inherently evil. Mm -hmm. Money is an accentuator, much like alcohol is an accentuator. If you're a good person, you will be a better person with money. Right. Because you'll have more freedom to do great things like a Mackenzie Scott. If you're a bad person, you'll end up doing more evil shit. Right. And same thing with alcohol. When you, it, Alcohol is a very much an accentuator. If you're a good person, you drink. Now, can you make some stupid decisions? Yeah. And have I done that? Yep. Um, but you're not going to turn into a worse person, typically, right. unless you go overboard. It's an accentuator bad person do worse, do worse things. So money is not the root of all evil. Um, evil is evil, right? So success at the end of the day, long story short, is people being happy in whatever they're doing in life and accomplishing in life. And I think that there's far more to accomplish in life than just being driven by money. Mm -hmm. um, but what I will say is that money has allowed me to do really cool things. Uh, and give a lot of money away that has helped a lot of people, whether it's in childhood cancer research, whether it's with the Boys and Girls Club, whether it's with cancer research for Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, um, many things that have been accomplished and that I've been able to see come through fruition with being able to give back uh, from some of my success as well. But bottom line, be happy. So you have this property now. Um, it's a horse ranch. You could call it, it is that. a gathering place. Call it that. 
What is your What is your goal with it? What's your My goal is uh, kind of what we stated earlier is to have like minded people come get better. Uh, in its simplest form, is like my my unique gift is to help others uh, find and develop their unique gifts. And so, whether again we're talking spiritually, financially, professionally. Um, uh, physically and nutritionally, mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure that we're helping uh, achieve those things for people and they can see the, their best versions of themselves. Um, so many people struggle with, uh, they talk about work-life balance, and that's a myth. Uh, that's been proven to be a myth. Uh, work-life integration is more about what it is. Right. Right. So uh, just in the, inherently, if we're working uh, eight to 10 hours per day and we're sleeping six to eight hours per day, there's no balance because balance indicates 50 50. So we're automatically out of whack. So it's a, how do you spend your time and how do you uh, spend the quality of your time with your kids, with your loved ones, whatever it might be, as well as uh, pour everything into your profession in the time allocated that you have. Arnold Schwarzenegger's response to that would be sleep faster. <laughs> Well, there is something to that is depending on what your goals are and if you're motivated to be really, really successful and you have specific goals to make a certain amount or get to a certain spot, then yeah, then you're probably going to want to outwork others. All right. If that's not, so that's why I can't define success for others is if you're not driven by that and you're driven more to uh, be a great philanthropist in your time because not everyone's gonna have the benefit like Mackenzie Scott has and, and, and have billions of dollars to give away, but they have their time to give away. And some of those people that are uh, choosing to be big brothers or big sisters or for uh, underprivileged youth, um, those that are choosing to uh, go into the foster system and foster kids that have been left behind, mm -hmm. like they're giving their time and their treasures now, now, when I say treasures, not money, I'm talking about internal treasures to these kids, like that is changing the world as well. Right. So that's probably a long rant, but no, no, that's great. Is is there any specific projects you have planned for this? Well, this podcast Perfect. is one of them. The hosting, uh, I'm going to have leader to leader conversations once a month. Uh, we don't have a title for the podcast yet because I'm starting over. So for those that want to follow uh, me on social media, we will be rolling that out soon. Uh, all my social media is at Josh Kosnick, K-O-S-N-I-C-K uh, is how you spell the last name. And we'll be rolling that out as we speak. So we're going to have leader to leader conversations. And then once a month, we're going to do this. It's going to be me and a couple of uh, other guys who have a cigar and a bourbon and discuss leadership in the world as it's happening or not happening, uh, whether that be politics, whether that be geopolitical stuff, whether that be the Ukraine things, um, whether it be uh, businesses and where leadership is being displayed or not displayed. I think the most popular one as we speak today is Elon Musk's acquisition of Twitter. Yeah, We could talk about that over a fine cigar and fine drink and, and discuss from different lenses. Very cool. So that'll happen once a month. Then the other stuff on the property is going to happen as as it as it comes along, um, whether it's uh, me hosting friends that uh, or or clients uh, from my leadership coaching business where they can come to get better as well. That's awesome. What are you most excited about right now? Uh, it'd be hard to say anything outside my kids. Um, I have a 10, eight, six and four year olds. So uh, obviously the business excites me and in, in pouring into others. Um, but my family's always been number one. I like it. I like it. I think that is everything we had everything you have as planned. a plan of questions to go over. Um, so let's talk, you, talk about what you have planned for this, these podcasts and the yep. magazine. Then. Yep. So so we are launching our first issue of ATF magazine on July 4th this year. Um, we have a great lineup of content. Super excited. Um, America's day. Right. Yeah. We were right away. We were talking and we're like, we've got, let's launch in July. And then we're like, why, why July? Let's pick a day, July 4th. It, it, there's not a better hashtag America. Although that's a day that the post office isn't working. So oh. you're not going to get your, your issue on July 4th, July 3rd, maybe. I don't know what, I don't know what day that falls on. 
Well, it could um, be, but either way, it'd be uh, you got your digital issue that yep, can come up. Yep. So we'll have digital issue, online content, this podcast, um, and and like I said before, our goal is to just highlight stories, businesses, brands, products. Um, and not just digging into the product because there's enough publications and, and media content out there that's just focused on product. Um, and those do great. Um, and I know there's, there's some, and a lot of those include digging into the stories behind them, but that's something that we want to focus on is, is why are we like for you? Why are we sitting down with you? Um, how do you do what you do? What drives you? Um, and digging into the why behind the stories. And I think that's, that's, what's most interesting. That's what's going to stand the test of time. We want it to be a magazine that you can pick up years down the road and from the design images, stories, um, they're always going to be relevant. Magazine um, by the people for the people. Right. I dig it. Right. Yeah. So really excited where this is going. It's been a fun project. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, atflifestyle.com is, is where you can go to subscribe. Um, there we'll have we'll have online content we'll have the digital issues we'll have articles going up uh that are just exclusively digital um and then we'll have um the online issues as well nice um well, i'm excited for it to come out yep obviously this is a passion of mine i'm right. happy and thankful that you came to think i'm interesting enough to right. talk right so that's been, been fun. fun yeah absolutely this has been great thank you, you